So this morning, I would like to start very seriously, because God is very serious, with some jokes. <laughs> Who was the greatest financier in the Bible? The answer was Noah, for he was floating a stock while everyone else was in liquidation. <laughs> what did God say after he created Adam? I can do better than that. Let me create a woman. <laughs> and all the men said, boo. Who was, who was the greatest female financier in the Bible? Pharaoh's daughter. She went down to the bank of the Nile and drew out a little profit. What kind of man was Boaz before he got married? Ruthless. Oh. Who was the first drug addict in the Bible? Nebuchadnezzar, he was on grass for seven years. <laughs> so my druggies out there. <laughs> oh, Woohoo, someone said. <laughs> we, won't, uh, we won't say anything, Terrence. Well, this morning, I really want to continue on the series that we've been preaching on, which is Redemption's Symphony. Redemption Symphony. We've been looking at the covenants of the Bible, and we have split them up into, we're going to talk about eight major covenants, but there are many covenants in the Bible. And I wanted to ask a question this morning, because this is something I've been meditating on, is if you remove the covenants in the Bible, if you just took them out of the story, what would be left to know about God? Think about it. What do you know about God that isn't through a covenant. If you say, well, everything, then you need to read the Bible again. <laughs> and you need to see that the covenant is the way that we actually get to know God. Without his covenants, there is no knowledge of God. There is no relationship to God. And there is no access to God. Last week, we talked about Noah and how God cut covenant with man and with creation and said, I will never destroy the earth again like I did with the great flood. If it wasn't for covenant, we would all be dead. <laughs> and this typhoon that was coming in, we could all, even if we weren't dead yet, there would be a slight little fear <laughs> that maybe this is it, that God has had enough. And because we broke the covenant as Adam did in the garden, he would destroy us all. How did you wake up this morning going, oh, it's just a T8. Let me get to church anyway. Let me stay in bed. Because you know that God cut a covenant with creation and put his rainbow in the sky and said, I will never destroy earth again. I will remember my covenant. And so outside of covenant, covenant there really is no redemption. There is no knowledge of God. There is no relationship. There are no promises. There is nothing good on the earth outside of covenant. And so part of my conundrum as a, as a budding preacher, I'm trying to learn the craft of preaching, is when you put it together a message, you're trying to make it pertinent to people and say, okay, what's the takeaway? What's the goal? What's the focus of this message? So people feel blessed when they go home and they go, wow, God loves me or God's good or I need to respond to this thing. And this morning, as I've been processing this message, I'm saying, God, but I don't have a punch. I don't have a purpose. I don't have an arrow. And God revealed to me, because he needs to, because I'm not clever. Uh, <laughs> that sometimes we have become a little dull to our relationship with God because the preaching has been made too personal. And so when I hear a preach, I go, how does that relate to me? What do I do? How does that make me feel? And we go home thinking that the message was about me. And I'm sure there was a song very recently in the last 20 years that was written about, it's not about me. Um, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> sing it, yeah, just sing it for us, Shay. <laughs> it's not about me, okay, a a but most Christians think that it's all about me. The best thing you can do to make it all about you and look at how God relates to you is to look at covenant, because covenant really, at its foundation, is not about you at all. And so if you come to today's message saying, okay, what does this mean for me? You're going to get the least out of this message. But if you come to today's message going, okay, God, how, what does this mean about you? 
and your relationship and what you did, you're going to get the most out of this message for yourself. Because you're going to see the motif of the covenant. You're going to see a picture of what God has done throughout the ages to demonstrate his nature, his goodness, his will, his intentions, his purpose, and namely his son, which is all about you. But if you look at it and going first, going, what is, what's in it for me? How does this relate to me? You're going to miss out on the sun. And then it's going to mean very little to you. So this morning, I want you to put your goggles on, your uh, JC goggles, your Jesus goggles, and go, how is this about Jesus? Because that'll make the most effect in your life. How does this relate to Jesus? So when you see Jesus in these covenants of redemption, wow, the Bible just comes alive. His word becomes alive. Life becomes alive. Isn't that a novel thing? <laughs> because you can see Christ in all. But when you go, I'm at the center and it's all about me, you're going to miss out on everything. Because all of eternity is about him. Just lift your hand and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. It's all about you and not about me. Thank you. Thank you. So in our time-space world, the first covenant cut, uh, and again, don't be religious about this. There's different ways to slice the pie. But the first covenant we focused on was the covenant with Eden or the covenant in the garden with mankind. The Edenic covenant. Let me pronounce that correctly. And in Eden, man was put on probation. Man was put into or placed into a covenant of works that said if he behaved by the conditions of the covenant, he would receive blessing. But if he broke the covenant, he would receive curse. And so Adam and Eve ate the apple. It's not really an apple. It's probably a fig, Todd. With Todd. <laughs> and, and they broke covenant. <laughs> yes, there, there we go, Todd. That's your normal seat. <laughs> and so right from the beginning of creation... Man was thrown out of the pleasure, out of the Garden of Eden, out of relationship with God, because man broke the covenant. And immediately, even before they've left the garden, God has cut a new covenant called the Adamic covenant. He cut a covenant with man to say, I'm going to cover over your sin that you've just committed, and I'm going to kill an animal and spill blood to cover over. And in that covenant, he prophesies about the seed of Eve that would crush the serpent's head. And we looked two weeks ago at how the, the man was created from the dust and to the dust he returned. And how the snake, the serpent, was condemned to the dust. He had to operate where man was operated. And so in the desert, Jesus attends to man. He serves man by becoming by redeeming man from the dust to take him back into opportunity a covenant with God. He paid the penalties sacrificially, covenantally. Jesus spilled his blood to redeem man back from the dust to relationship with God. Somebody say amen. That, that's what our Jesus did for us. And so Adam was brought up in the garden and fell. So Jesus went to the dust, to the desert, to raise us up. And that's why Romans 5 is such an important passage of Scripture. Because it talks about first Adam and last Adam. And how first Adam condemned all mankind. But how last Adam raised us up to life, to abundant life. And we rule and reign in last Adam because of what Jesus did. Then last week, we looked at the Noanic, Noahic covenant. I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> but the covenant cut with Noah. And because every intention of man's heart was evil from his youth, God decided he would destroy the whole earth, except for one man. One man was blameless before the Lord. One man was looked on with favor because he was righteous. Now, here's the thing. Many Christians today... Not today in Hong Kong because of the typhoon. But uh, many Christians across the earth are talking about unity. We've got to have unity. We've got to have unity. And what they mean when they say unity is they're going to get every Christian together. And if we all pray hard enough and we all meet enough and we all do the right thing enough and confess our sins and the sins of our nations enough at the church prayer meeting, then God will bless us. That's not what Noah did. What did Noah do? He was blameless. 
He walked right with God. And because of the favor that was on him, it says in Hebrews 11 that he worked in reverent fear to save his family. Unity is not getting everyone on board. (laughs) Unity (laughs) means one. One man was righteous. And one man had unity with God through a covenant. And when he had unity, one man, he was saved. Salvation came because he had a personal relationship with God. Not because he had a whole pile of Christians praying and getting the church praying means together. And there is a room for prayer of the saints and there is encouragement, all of that. But who was around David when he had to encourage himself? He didn't call a church prayer meeting to help him. He knew that he had a covenant with one God. That's the unity that we need. And so it's wonderful to come to church. I'm so grateful that so many of us come to church this morning. And it's wonderful to have brothers and sisters. But I'm telling you, if you have a covenant with the Most High, you don't need anybody else. You need a one-man covenant. And today we're going to look at the third iteration of the the unfolding arc of redemption that God demonstrates to mankind in the uh, Abrahamic covenant. That one man who had faith in God. And we're going to see how that faith relates to us and how we are also one man. So Abraham... It seems, there's, no, there's not much writing before this, but it seems that Abraham is just a, a random guy in the middle of nowhere. I don't know if God chose him for a particular reason. I don't know if there was a quality about him that God liked. But it says that in the beginning of Genesis 12, this is now after Noah, it says that the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, Go from your country, from your people, from your father's house to the land I will show you. Was Abraham a good guy? Was it a bad guy? It seems to me it makes no difference. What does make a difference is that God favored him and God chose him. And because he then calls him out of the place that he was, out of his father's house, just because of the motif, think to Gideon. When Gideon was called, you mighty warrior, because he saw the covenants that were cut with his forefathers, namely Abraham, what is the first thing that Gideon has to do? He has to sacrifice the idols of his father. There's something you need to leave in religion that might have even birthed you, might have even taken to a place where now you have a relationship that you need to forego and let go of. The Jews had a big problem with this when the new covenant was announced. They did not want to let go of that which brought them to Jesus. And so, it's not my preach today, but I, there's something powerful about leaving the place that you were to move into the place that God has called you. This is a big step of faith. Big step of faith. We haven't even really looked at faith yet, but you can see that Abraham is responding to God in a crazy way. Go to the land will I, that I will show you. Ab- God, um, can you give me a map? Can you show me how to get there? What is it must I do? What are the terms and conditions? What's this going to cost me? Nothing is written. He just says, I want you to leave, and I want you to go. Something about the new covenant that means you have to leave some stuff to enter into what God's called you to do. He's announcing his covenant in the next verse we're going to read. He starts to announce the covenant that he wants to cut with Abraham. And he says... Abraham, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. Everyone just quickly just stop there and just say, bless Father Abraham. (laughs) You have just tricked God into blessing you. Because everyone who blesses Abraham is going to be blessed. I bless Abraham seven times, 77. (laughs) If you really took the promises at God's word, you'd be blessing Abraham every day. (laughs) I bless those who bless you. And whoever curses, don't say another word for a second. Whoever curses, I will curse. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people 
peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Wow. The gravity of the promise. It's a little reminiscent of the promise that was given to Adam in the garden. I want you to go in all the earth. I want you to bless you. I want to bless you. That's God's intention, and his purpose is to bless. That's who God is. You can't help but be around blessing if you're around God. It says somewhere in the Psalms that when you encounter God's face in his train, there are gifts forevermore. Why? Because that's who he is. If you knew the musk that I have, the, the smell, <laughs> if you followed behind me, even if you couldn't see me, you would smell Sean, the blessing. <laughs> Patrick is blocking his nose, and rightfully so. But when you hang around God, you can't help but be blessed. So God is announcing to Abraham, because you're going to be with me, I'm going to bless you, just because I'm with you. You cut covenant with me, you're going to be blessed. You can't help it. I'm going to bless all nations through you. And then verse 7 of the same chapter, and this is now the second time God appears to Abraham. And God says, to your offspring, I will give this land. And so Abraham built a Lord, uh, 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 an altar to the Lord. So I'm going to look at those three. There's three dimensions of the blessing that God is about to announce. I want to say to you this. There are seven times, I, I had to count them myself. There's no Google, unfortunately, on how many times God appeared to, know, uh, to Abraham. So in my count, so it's susceptible to huge error because I'm not good at counting. Uh, it looks like to me that there are seven times that God speaks to Abraham about covenant. Seven times. And in this unfolding revelation of the covenant that Abraham is entering into, there are announcements, there are activations, there are ratifications, there are confirmations, there's the actual cutting of the covenant, there's a sign of the covenant, and then there's promises based on that covenant and oaths. If you don't believe me, go and read the Bible. Go and read Genesis 12, 13, 14, uh, in particular 12, 15, 17, and 22. Can you guys remember that? 12, 15, 17, 22. And you will see the unfolding revelation of the covenant that God is cutting with Abraham. And in this covenant, in the first three verses we've got here, four verses, there are three dimensions of this unfolding covenant. The first dimension is the dimension of land. He says, and I'm going to give your offspring this land. Everyone say land. Yeah. Second dimension is the dimension of blessing. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless all those who bless you and curse all those. There's a blessing that comes from the covenant that Abraham is cutting with God. And the third dimension is, any guesses? Seed. Seed. If you know Galatians 3. You know what the seed is. So God is going to cut a covenant in which the, the promises and the benefits of the covenants are land, seed, and blessing. Everyone say land, seed, blessing. Land, seed, blessing. Good job, Samuel. <laughs> land, seed, and blessing. Genesis 15. This is now... The next iteration of the covenant that God is cutting with Abraham. Be believe me, believe me, we are going somewhere this morning about faith. Believe me. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. After this, after this, what is the this? Well, if that's Genesis 15, Genesis 14 uh, is before this. <laughs> and what happens in Genesis 14 is, is something absolutely phenomenal. I wish I could take three hours and just preach on just Genesis 14, but I'm going to give you the gist. Lot is Abraham's nephew, and Lot is given an option of what part of the land he wants to go to because there was so much blessing on Abraham that it overflowed to Lot. Lot did not have a covenant announced to him of how he would relate to God and how God would bless him and give him land. But because of the covenant that was on Abraham, it just abundantly overflowed. That's why the company that you work for, the school that you work for, the boss that you work for should be blessed. Because they have a relationship. No, because you have a relationship with the Most High. And there should be an abundance on you that favors them. 
It was the very same abundance that was on Joseph when he went into Egypt and he was promoted. Even when he was in prison, he was promoted because of the blessing that was on his life. And so Lot is blessed. And the shepherds between Lot and Abraham start to conflict and fight. And so Abraham, to solve the problem, says, Lot, you have the choice of whether you want to go left or right. And Lot chooses what looks to be the most abundant land. And Abraham says, you go that way, I'll go this way. Because Lot didn't have a covenant relationship with God, when he left Abraham's side and he left the blessing that was on Abraham, he ended up in a whole pile of trouble, even though he was in a well-watered land. Think about Eden. And in that land, he was living in the towns of Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you know what happens in Sodom and Gomorrah? We're going to read in a... We're going to focus on some things in a second. And so he's in this place where great evil is happening. Great sin. So much sin that in Genesis 18, God says, I've heard the cries. And I'm going to go and check out Sodom. Because if it's really as bad as people are saying it is, I'm going to destroy the whole place. And he does. And so, but this is where Lot has made his home. But Abraham goes to the Negev. He goes to the desert. Very Jesus-esque. Can you see, as you unfold the covenants, you can see similarities. You can see the picture being painted. That's why God makes rivers flow in the desert. And so Lot ends up in these towns. And these towns rebel against their masters. And the four kings that are, that are over the five kings in the valley, uh, in this well-watered plain, come out to battle. And they beat the rebels. And they take Lot and his wife and his children into their possession. And Abraham hears about it. Now watch this. Because the blessing is so great on Abraham, he is prepared to deal with the issue. And so he has 318 trained men in his household ready to go back and fight these kings who have just won a battle, by the way, against five kings. Four kings have won. And Abraham's just got 318 trained men. But because he's ready, he goes and rescues Lot back. And what happens in that valley when he comes back from battle is that the king of Sodom comes out to meet him. And the king of Sodom says, Abraham, you're so great. You're so wonderful. Thank you. You take all the share. And Abraham says, I will not take anything from this except what my men have already eaten and the share that belongs to other people. I will never take anything from you. Because I never want anyone to say that man made me rich. Wow. How can Abraham say that? <laughs> because Abraham had a covenant. And he didn't want man getting the credit for what God was doing in his life. And so he did not partake in what was rightfully, in an earthly sense, what was rightfully his, he did not partake. The king of Sodom, the city about to be destroyed three chapters later. Right there, in that same valley, whilst he's having a conversation with the king of Sodom, guess who shows up? But Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is the king of righteousness from Jerusalem. The king of peace and the king of righteousness. And he comes out with bread and with wine. That should remind you, Christian, of something. <laughs> something about covenant. And as a type of Christ, Hebrews tells us, Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Now think about this. At the very same moment, in the very same value, in the very same conversation, there Abraham is talking to the king of Sodom and the king of Jerusalem, Melchizedek. The very same time. I want to tell you, Christian, there are always going to be opportunities <laughs> when it looks like your greatest blessing has come along. You take everything that God's going to ask you to choose him over the stuff. Because Abraham won that battle. It was his stuff. And he rejected it for the sake of the covenant. There's always an opportunity to rely on something that man can do. What you can do. Your performance. Your effort. Your skill. Your reading of the Bible. Your hard work. Or rely on what God's able to do. And receive blessing because he blesses you. Not because you earn it or because you deserve it. Yeah. That's going to feed into later. But I want you to see that Abraham had the choice to rely on man or rely on God. And he chose God. 
That is a great man of faith. And so, Genesis 15, it says after this, this has just gone down to Genesis 14, the battle, the rescuing of Lot, and uh, Lot's uh, future is terrible. Go and read up on Lot, but he has kids that end up being, uh, incest kids that end up being the enemy of Israel, just a, just a bad advertisement for not having a, well, good advertisement for not having a covenant, for thinking that you have a covenant. This is why it's not good to just be brought up in the church thinking that you're a Christian. There's a lot, a lot of lot of lots who, because mommy and daddy was a Christian, well, I'm a Christian. No, no, no. You're not a Christian just because you come to church. You're not a Christian because mommy and daddy were a Christian. You have to have a personal, unified relationship, unity with Jesus. Otherwise, you're not a Christian. You're just a lot. And lot ended up in a very small place of diminishment. You're hiding in the mountains, scared about everything. So these battles have just gone down. God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, do not be afraid. I am your shield. I am your very great reward. Now, the question I want to ask you is why would Abraham be afraid? I can think of three reasons. The first reason he could be afraid is that God is powerful. And often when you see God in the Bible, you see people falling on their face in fear as though dead. And the first thing that Jesus said, one of the most popular messages he said after his resurrection was, do not be afraid. <laughs> the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, I know many grace, grace preachers don't like to say that the fear of the Lord is fearful. They try and make it reverence and hope. Fear is fear. And if you meet something that's powerful, you're going to feel fear because you're going to come into an encounter that you know that there's a power greater than what you can accomplish. You should be afraid of a big stallion horse. Not an afraid of like an irrational fear. You should be afraid that that thing, if it kicks you, it's going to kill you. And so you treat it with respect. There is a reverence for God. There is a holy fear that you need to have. Not because if you have fear that somehow you make God bigger, because God is big and powerful, you should have a fear. It is a natural reaction. And then allow God to say, do not fear. When the one who has all the power says, don't fear, you know you don't have to be afraid. But if you don't see God in his power, you're in trouble. You need to see a powerful God. So don't belittle. Don't belittle the fear of the Lord. It is the beginning of wisdom. A lot of stupid, intelligent, but stupid, foolish Christians. Because they diminish the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is powerful and great. And so the first reason I can see Abraham being afraid is that God is powerful. Another possible reason is that Abraham is worried about the backlash from the kings. He's just defeated himself with a little army of 318 trained men. And so, Abraham, don't be afraid. You've just won the battle. They're not going to come back and beat you up. That could be a reason. The third reason, which I think is very compelling, is that Abraham has just had a battle where he's rescued Lot. And he knew the blessing that was on him, but was not on Lot. And therefore, he knew when he died... He couldn't take possession of the land because he knew there was something on him that was not on Lot. And so Abraham, don't be afraid. I'm going to give you this land it's going to say in a second. I'm still going to bless you even when you can't do anything about it. Was an announcement of a covenant that didn't just sit with Abraham, but that would last to his descendants. Because the covenant is land, blessing, and seed. And so the covenant wasn't just, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. It's, I'm going to bless your seed too. Don't be afraid, Abraham. I'm your shield, your very great reward. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my state is a family member. And Abraham said, You have given me no children, so a servant of my household will be my heir. A servant will never inherit the blessing. Galatians 4, Galatians 5, talks about the slave woman's child, Ishmael, not being able to capacitate the blessing. And Sarah says to Abraham, throw the slave woman's child out, for he will never share in the inheritance of the son born of the free woman. And so Abraham knew that if it's just some other person, some servant of my household, it couldn't sustain the blessing. I need someone of my own seed to sustain the blessing. Then the word of the Lord came to him and said, This man will not be your heir. And a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. Whoa. Abraham knew. If I'm going to sustain the blessing. 
It's going to be someone who's under the same blessing as me. It can't be leveraged to something else, someone else. The slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. God took Abraham outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. Now, this is very interesting. Up until now, when he announced the blessing to Abraham, he said, let's go to Genesis 13, verse 16. He said, I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Every announcement of the covenant so far has been about dust. Now in Genesis 15, it says, look up at the stars and count the stars. That's how I'm going to make your offspring. Now watch this. What's the difference between Genesis 12 and Genesis 15? Melchizedek in Genesis 14. He has met a type and a shadow of the Christ. So now that Christ is introduced into the picture, he's no longer looking at just an earthly man. He's now looking at a heavenly man. I want, you, I want to take your attention to Hebrews 11. This is the great hallway of uh, the heroes of the faith. This is such an encourage. If you ever feel down or depressed or, oh, I don't know if God hears me. I don't know what's happening. Go and read Hebrews 11. This, is, this should be one of your favorite chapters in the Bible. By faith, we understand that the world is framed. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. By faith, we understand that Abel, when he offered a sacrifice, was considered uh, with favor compared to Cain's. And by faith, his blood still cries out. By faith, Noah worked in reverent fear and saved his whole family. And so just eight verses in, talking about Abraham, says, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Don't let information stop you from going where God called you to go. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob. How many here live in tents? You're not nomadic. You live in bricks and mortar. You live in something permanent. Abraham, when he went to that land, he lived in a tent because it was not permanent. Remember, dust is of the earth, heaven. Star stars are of heaven. And so when he's wandering around the dust, he's still living in a tent. It's a temporary, and not a permanent house. He says, by faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did the continuation of the covenant, who was heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, oh, let's just read. I love, I love this. I'm making a point. I'll come back to it. I just like reading scripture. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he is good as dead, one man, unity. Please, let's have unity back in the church. <laughs> let's have one man. <laughs> and, it, and he is good as dead. Which really isn't no, it's not unity, it's like no, no uh, <laughs> Cause the one man was dead. He came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand of the seashore. All these people were still living by faith. When they died, they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. And it's talking about a lot of people of faith. And saying, they only saw at a distance what was coming. But when they died, they died in faith. Because they believed him who was faithful. Who made the promise. See, people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. Abraham wasn't in a country of his own because he lived in a tent. They're looking for a country whose architect and builder is God. Whose foundations are from him. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had an opportunity to return. Instead, they were looking for a better country. Hebrews is all about the old and the new covenant, a better covenant built on better promises with a better mediator and a better sacrifice and blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. 
Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared, he has prepared, he has prepared a city for them. Abraham did not prepare a city. In fact, when he went to the land that he was being given, he didn't build a thing. He had a tent that he moved around. Because he was looking forward to a heavenly country. I wonder why Genesis 14 is so powerful. Because he saw someone that was a type and shadow of a heavenly man. Verse 39, talking about all these heroes of the faith, it says, they were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received, had received what had been promised. That means Isaac wasn't the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham, because Isaac also had the same covenant confirmed to him, and so did his child, Jacob. So these are our patriarchs, or our patriarchs. Let me get there in a second. These were the Jewish patriarchs. These were the heads of the family. If the fulfillment was Isaac, then Isaac wouldn't have received the same promise. And yet he did. So when it talks about Abraham's seed, it's not talking primarily about Isaac. Although he was a dimension. He was a, he was a sign and a shadow of the thing that was coming. And so they're all commanded for the faith. None of them received what would have been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. That means the fulfillment of the promise has now come into play way uh, 2,000 years after Abraham. 1,976 years after Abraham. Did Jesus cut covenant? And it was, the promise is fulfilled in him, the seed of Abraham. And so under that old system, and there's many covenants in that old picture, everything is looking forward to the seed to whom the promise had referred. Everything's looking forward. From the moment that Jesus cuts covenant on the cross, everything looks back to the cross. And so only together with us, did all of those people who are looking forward, only together with us, because now Christ has been made manifest, are the promises fulfilled in God. Now remember, the difference between looking at the dust and looking at the stars in heaven is Melchizedek, the type and shadow of Christ. That's the difference. When we move for, back from dust to be elevated back in last Adam to a heavenly country, a heavenly land. Do you know that when, not in Hong Kong, because we have so much light, we have so much, we have concrete foundations and lights and uh, when you look up in the heavens, you can't see much here. But if you go out in the middle of a desert, Bonnie and I, a couple years ago, were in the Moab Desert. And when you look up with no light pollution, you're out in the country like Abraham was in a tent. A tent that when I tried to set up one night, uh, it was 9 or 10 o'clock at night, the light was going down, couldn't see, mozzies everywhere. We were, we were two meters away from the Colorado River. And we get the car, we, we put the lights on to shine it on the place we're going to set up the tent. And there's a little bit of dew on the, on the grass. And a gust of wind picks up the tent and starts to blow it into the Colorado River. To Bonnie's delight, she is hearing me recount the story. And because of a little bit of dew, as I try to run and catch the tent, I slip over and I smack myself very, very hard. I caught the tent. <laughs> but I can remember very clearly being it in the open skies. With the, there's, no, there's no clouds in the desert for the most part. And there's no light pollution. And you'd look up and it's just white. And, a, and what they say is the Milky Way, when you look it up with the clearest of, of night skies, it looks like a cloud. Because the stars, you can't count the stars. Not because you don't have the time, but because it all amalgamates into something that looks like a cloud. What is Abraham looking but a cloud? Next verse. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses... The heavenly man came and provided a promise that said, I'm going to elevate you like first Adam from the dust back up to the clouds. Wow. And so when he's speaking to Abraham, he's saying, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm not going to bless you, though, just in the dust. I'm going to take you back up wow. to the clouds. That's why when he saw Melchizedek, God could speak to him in a new dimension. And so when Abraham believed the promise, he didn't believe because it was a small promise, he believed because it was an impossible promise. And it can only be a heavenly man who could answer it. 
We're going to read in a second that the gospel was preached and advanced to Abraham. And Abraham believed the gospel. Our father of faith. Powerful. You can't just read these scriptures and go, oh, well, we just was here and this thing. You know, these are power. These, these are the promises that you and I are plugged into. A heavenly promise. So when you read the promises to Abraham, the land, the seed, and the blessing, the land isn't talking. It is talking about Israel, the physical Palestinian covenant, they call it. It is talking about Israel, but it's also talking about heaven. So only together with us, the great cloud of witnesses, that one heavenly man who we placed in, do the promises get fulfilled. Isn't that powerful? Abraham, Abraham saw that. Abraham saw it. Let's go back to 15 verse 6. It's a previous slide. Then the Lord came to him and said, this son, <laughs> can, you see, can you read it now when he says, this man will not be your heir? You think when you're reading the story linearly, it's Isaac he's about to talk about. He's not talking about Isaac. He is, but the motif of the covenant of redemption is talking about the Christ, the one man. But this, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. That's why Jesus needed to come through the lineage of Abraham. If you read the Gospels, you will read the lineage and you see that Jesus came from Abraham. Don't get bored the next time you read Matthew and it's like, and this one begat that one and this one began that one. I want to tell you there is revelation in the genealogies because it's talking about who the Christ was and it is a fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham. He took him outside, said, look at the stars, if you can count them, then, then uh, <laughs> that's how much blessing I'm going to bless you with. So shall your offspring be. Watch this. This is, I think, this is probably, as man's response to God, this is the most powerful verse in the Bible. This is the foundation of Christianity. This is the foundation of what takes us out of this earthly world and puts us in a heavenly country, in the land that God called us to be. This is the fulfillment of the blessing in Christ. And this is directly referring to the seed. This is the Abrahamic covenant right now. This is your response and my response to the Abrahamic covenant. Abraham believed. Everyone say, Abraham believed. If you miss those two words, you miss the new covenant. If you take these two words out of the new covenant, you know that you have zero access to God. You have zero access to the blessing, zero access to any heavenly country, and you have zero access to Jesus. It's because Abraham believed that he was able to access, and we access exactly the same way. We're going to read that in Romans 4. It says, Abraham believed the Lord. And he was credited. And it was credited to him as righteousness. How do you get righteous before the Lord? Most religion will tell you, do the right thing. Avoid the bad thing. Sacrifice to this. Move over here. You got to do this thing. If you're good enough and if you gamble enough and if God is a good mood... Then you will be righteous. This is what separates us as believers, Christians, Christ followers from every other religion, including atheism, including paganism, including Catholicism, including some forms of Protestantism it, it, and Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism. All the isms, this is what separates us, is that we believe God and it's belief that justifies you. Because whilst Abraham believed that as, as though, as if he was as good as dead, which means his actions produce nothing. In Genesis 17, it talks about circumcision. And God says to Abraham, I want you to circumcise. Why does circumcision have value? Circumcision has value as a sign of the covenant, not a work of the covenant. As a sign of the covenant, because circumcision, as Rob says, it gives you the snip on the tip. Why the snip on the tip? 
because that's the point at which you produce children. I don't want to give people the birds and the bees talk right now, but that's the point at which you produce. And so God was showing Abraham, this is not something you produce. It's something I produce. So throw that dead thing away, Abraham. So powerful was that sign of of circumcision, the sign of the covenant that God had between Abraham and himself, that when Moses is coming back, it doesn't matter, but Moses at one point hasn't circumcised his child. And Moses almost dies and his son almost dies. And his wife says, Moses, you're not circumcised. When they circumcise Moses and the son, or the son, they're released from the bondage of death. Because if you don't throw away those old things that can be done in the power of man, that's the way that you're going, is death. So are we, in the new covenant, we call it dead works. It's trying to produce by your own flesh. So God says, throw that away, Abraham. I want to bring a disting- I want to distinguish between what you're able to do and what I'm able to do. And I want to tell you, circumcision is barbaric. I've watched some videos online of eight-day-year-old Eight-day-old children getting circumcised. It is horrific. It is terrible. Those babies scream like you've never heard a baby scream. Horrific. I don't know if I could do that to Sammy. But God is giving you a picture of the pain that his son went through. A little snip on the tip picture of how his son was thrown out of the camp. How his pain redeemed us so that we didn't have to produce so that he could produce. Powerful imagery. But you only see that imagery if you go through Redemption Symphony and look at these different covenants. Why is circumcision a thing? Painful as it is. Because circumcision removes what you're able to do. That's the sign of the covenant. When God cuts covenant with Abraham, he says, you don't have to do anything about it. I'm going to produce it. Abraham believed the Lord and said, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of Chaldeans. Can you see God's developing language for Israel in the future when he's going to bring them out of slavery? He's he's just practicing now. I brought you out and I'm going to give you this land to take possession of it. Who do you think was speaking to Israel when they came out of bondage? But the same man who brought Abraham out of Babylon. When they heard that from the Lord, they must have heard, wow, we are Abraham's children. If he delivered Abraham, he's going to deliver us. Isn't that powerful? The same prayer that that Mary prays in Luke 1. is God, you have been merciful to your servant. And you have remembered the covenant that you cut with Abraham. So it's so powerful to see that Abraham had a covenant with God. And then a a few verses later, Zechariah says the same thing about a fulfillment of promise in Christ. Just after he's got circumcised or about to get circumcised. Because, he says, God remembered the covenant that you cut with Abraham. And you've got to remember the same covenant that he cut with Abraham. Because you're included in the promises that were promised to Abraham. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? Everybody say, how can I know? How can I know? Notice, Abraham has already said, I believe you, God. And he has already counted righteous. And now Abraham says, how can I be sure? How can I be sure that I can take possession of it? Do you know why he's asking that question? Because he knows he's not going to be around forever. He was sure. But just like Lot lost out and couldn't produce and was all about Sodom and Gomorrah rather than the desert where God had called Abraham. He himself was walking in the blessing, but he wasn't sure that his descendants would be able to walk in that same blessing. So he says to God, I need to be sure. I believe you and I am righteous, but how can I be sure that my descendants will walk in that same blessing? Notice God's response is not ridicule. How dare you ask me a question? I'm the Lord. You are just the clay. I'll have mercy on who I have. He doesn't react. He's not negative. God is so eager to answer the question of how he's going to bring his descendants into the promised land. You know, that's why we call it the promised land. Because it was promised to Abraham. 
How can I take possession of it? But Abraham said, God, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer. Bring me a goat. Can you get me the... Bring me a ram, each three years old, and a dove and a pigeon. Give me some animals. Abraham brought all these to God. Now, I don't have a ram, and I don't have a lamb, and I don't have a goat and a sheep and a cow and a chicken and a dove. But what I do have is a little uh, tiger from Sammy. Don't tell Sammy I'm doing this. <laughs> he's going to be upset. We're going to replace it before he finds out. If he finds this, he's going to have emotional damage for the rest of his life. Sammy, to the future Sammy, I'm sorry. How can I know that what you said is going to happen to my descendants, Lord? So God says, bring me some animals. Very, very reminiscent of what happened in the garden. Exactly the same process that happened with Noah. Now is going to play out with Abraham. In fact, <laughs> Adam's son, Abel, sacrificed a lamb. Do you know that? Yeah. Why a lamb? There's no precedent or pattern on the earth to sacrifice a lamb. Yeah. And why is a lamb better than the veggies that Cain was offering? Why is that superior? Why did that earn God's favor? I want to suggest to you that because Abel was looking into an eternal realm and he saw the lamb. Oh man, I, I really don't want to get emotional, <laughs> but you, it's really hard not to get emotional when you talk about the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth. And so when Abel looked into the eternal realm, eternal realm not the temporal realm that he could produce by his own effort like Cain did. But the eternal realm, he took a lamb and sacrificed it. And that's why it was looked upon with favor. Because he was looking at a covenant that God cut before the foundation of the earth. Before Adam. Before Noah. Before Abraham. And so, God says to Abraham, bring me some animals. I'm going to show you covenant. And so... <laughs> it's not about a tiger. <laughs> I'm not upset about this. <laughs> Can you bring up Isaiah 53? I'm sorry for being such a crybaby, but <laughs> when you see this coming and cut, it's not about the animals, it's about the seed that God is pointing to in the future. As I-53 talks about the suffering servant, that though was he, he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Not because he did anything wrong. <laughs> Surely he took up our pain. <laughs> Surely we considered him punished by God. Stricken. Afflicted. Surely he was pierced for our transgressions. Can you see when they're cutting up those animals? The brutality of having to cut through hide and skin and blood and guts and flesh and bone. Surely he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed. Think about this. If you're trying to cut through a fluffy animal, it's just a little bit of fluff. Just for YouTube demonetization. <laughs> but if you ever cut up a chicken, you have to crush bone. Surely he was crushed for our iniquities. Where did Isaiah get the picture of the suffering servant from? He got it from covenant. Because what Abraham did, according to God's instruction, was he cut the, uh, the animal in half. Can you imagine the imagery? Can you imagine the blood, the smell? He cuts the animal in half. Little Sammy's tiger. I should have prepared one earlier. He 
and he takes one half of the animal and he takes the other half of the animal and he cuts covenant. Do you know the word covenant means to cut? That's why the sign of circumcision is the sign of the covenant because it's cut. And that's why Jesus was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Surely the punishment that brought us peace was upon his, but was upon him. And his wounds healed us. Why? Because when God spoke to Abraham, let's go back to Genesis 15. He said, take the animals. Next slide. And Abraham cut them into two and arranged the halves opposite each other. And he chased away the birds. Why did he do that? Why did he cut them in half? Because the picture of covenant is this. If I don't honor the agreement, and if you don't honor the agreement, we will become like these animals we've just cut in two. It was a ceremony, more than a ceremony, but it was a ceremony and an agreement and a contract and a blood covenant that said, we will honor the agreement. And if you break the promise, if you break the conditions, you will become like this animal. And then you can read it. But as the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep. This is unusual. This does not happen with cutting covenants. You do not fall into a deep sleep. It's an active thing where usually a king and a subject would walk through together. They would walk through the halves of the body and saying if either of them broke it, they would become like this animal. God's about to cut covenant with Abraham and he puts Abraham to sleep and says, Abraham, I've got this one. And a fearful dread comes on him and a darkness like a cloud comes on him. And God himself, as the furnace and the branding torch, the, the, the torch, not the electric torch, but the fire torch, firebrand torch, God himself walks through the covenant and says, I will keep the promises of this covenant. And it's a foreshadow of the sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross for us. Because at the same time, there's a great darkness that falls on Jesus where he's on the cross. And Jesus is paying the penalty and the, the, uh, he's absorbing all the wrath. What's the wrath of God? It's the wrath of breaking covenant. He's absorbing all of that for the sake of you and I. Because when we broke Adamic covenant, and there's a covenant of redemption under, undergirding all of this. When we broke covenant with God, the penalties were, were that we had to be split open like these animals. So rather than Abraham walking through to take the penalties, God himself walks through to take the penalties. And on the cross, I do not understand this. I don't know if I can believe this. But on the cross, it sounds like heresy for, for what I'm about to say. I don't understand this. I don't know if I even agree with it. But to me, from covenantal language, it looks like God died. It looks like God was split in two. And he became the animal that was cut. I don't understand it. I don't want to believe that. But Isaiah 53 says he bore our sickness. He the punishment that was on us, that brought us peace, he took it in our place. And he was split. And where's Abraham in this picture? He's in a deep sleep. Because God said, I'm going to fulfill the covenant. How do you know, Abraham, that you can take possession of a heavenly country? You know, because I will fulfill the promise by my own blood. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, in John 8, there's a big discussion about who Jesus is and what's the validity of his testimony. He's saying, you know, I am the Messiah. I'm the sent one. I'm the lamb. John 1 says, John the Baptist saw him said, behold, the lamb of the world that takes away the sins of the earth. And they're discussing, what proof do you have, Jesus? And he says, 
Well, I know my father. <laughs> Everything I do, I was taught by my father. I only speak what my father tells me to speak. And they're going, well, we had Abraham. And he says to them something, mo the most powerful thing. He says, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Abraham wasn't opening the doorway for Jesus to be sacrificed later. Abraham was looking to the gospel. He was looking to what the sacrificial lamb did. And he was pointing to it. Abraham didn't open the door. Abraham accessed the door that Jesus had already opened to Abraham. That's why we call Abraham the father of faith. Just like my father was a teacher. He taught before I taught. When I started to teach because my father taught, I taught just the same way that he taught. Now, he's my father of teaching. He's my father of faith. But I have the same access, I have the same teaching, to use the analogy, that my father has. Our father, Abraham, is our father because he accessed first. And we are included in the promise to him. But we have exactly the same access because the saved covenant applies to us. We're going we're gonna to reach into that now. And there's a promise. Uh, we can re please read Genesis 15 in your own time. But there's an amazing promise and a, a prophecy of how Israel's going to go into bondage. But 400 years later, they're going to be delivered because of the covenant that God cut with Abraham. Everyone say, how can I know? How can I know? How can, how can you know? How do you know? Because of a covenant that was cut. Beautiful. Just say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. I want to just... Thank you. Okay, I want to bring this into the new covenant. Remember, we're looking at redemption symphony. And so as we look at each covenant, we're, we're extracting God's goodness and the pictures of that elephant with the nose and the ears and the tail and the body. And if you just look at just one element, you're going to miss out on the picture of what the full elephant is. Go back to week one if you can't remember what I'm talking about. Uh, but we're looking at the Abrahamic covenant and how that applies to Jesus, to the new covenant. So let's bring up Romans 4. What shall we say then? Abraham, our forefather, discovered according to the flesh, or discovered in this matter. If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about. We're introducing the idea in the new covenant that something you do has value in relation to your relationship to God. Do I bring something to the table? Do I add to the covenant? Is the covenant dependent on something that I do? Now remember... The imagery is very clear. The whole Jewish race, their, their single one-man father is Abraham. And how was Abraham given uh, uh, that, that uh, patriarch, let me English good me speak, uh, that position of being a patriarch? It was through the covenant that he cut. And where was Abraham in the covenant? Asleep. Asleep. <laughs> Abraham did not, the, did not cut the covenant. So Jews should know that Abraham had nothing to boast about because Abraham was sleeping. Do you know that story? I love the story, and I've taught it to Sammy, and we'll continue to teach it, but the little mother hen who's cooking the, the loaf of bread. And as she's cooking, she calls the fox and says, can you help me collect the wheat? And then she, then she phones uh, on her uh, iPhone 15. <laughs> it's a very modern story. She phones the elephant and says, elephant, can you help me to, to knead the bread? And then she phones the badger and says, can you help me to cook it in the oven? And they're all too busy, and they can't produce anything. And so when it comes time to eat the beautiful, delicious, smelling bread, the badger and the fox and the elephant all come for dinner and she says no 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 you didn't help make it you don't get to partake that is the way that some people approach the new covenant you need to do something in the new covenant in order for you to enjoy the pleasures and the promises that is not the new covenant at all the new covenant is God cutting covenant himself and putting you to sleep figuratively dead that's the introduction of Christianity to the Jews. Shall we still be circumcised? Shall, do we still need to do something in order to be called righteous? So I, Genesis 15 verse 6 is so powerful. Because they're talking about our forefather Abraham. 
he was not justified with works. If he was justified with works, he had something to boast about, not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God. Genesis 15 verse 6. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, does not work, but goes to sleep. The one who trusts God, uh, but who trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. Everyone say their faith. Their faith. Abraham was asleep whilst the covenant was being cut. The covenant, he was not included in de the deliverables on the covenant. He didn't have to bake the bread. He had to trust God to bake the bread. And when God baked the bread, God paid the penalty of the bread not being baked properly. Even though it wasn't his fault, it was man's fault. That's why it says, the one who does not work but trusts God who justifies the ungodly. That looks ungodly to me. That's the penalty of being ungodly. And he justifies. He pays the payment that's due. But he pays it himself. Their faith is credited as righteousness. You know, there are people, they're Christians. To this day, but in past times, it was more popular than it is today. When they sin, they take a whip. What's it called? Self-flagellation. And they beat themselves as penance to pay for their sin. I wonder if they saw the lamb that was slain, slain before the foundation of the earth, whether they would still beat themselves. I wonder if they saw Romans 4 to say that God is the one who justifies the ungodly. Would they still carry on? Because there's nothing you can do to justify yourself. There's only one who can justify you, and he did on the cross. Their faith is credited as righteousness. Next slide. Is this blessedness, the blessing given to Abraham? For the circumcised, those who perform a work, the sign of the covenant from Genesis 17, or for the uncircumcised, we have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstance was it credited? Do you know the answer to that question? What circumstance was Abraham's righteousness credited to him? Was it before he was circumcised or after? Genesis 15, we read, he was credited as righteous. Genesis 17, he gets the sign of circumcision. It was before. Paul knows this, and he knows the people he's writing to know this. He says, under what circumcised was accredited? Uh, circumstance. Circumcised. i got circumcision on the brain. Uh, <laughs> what, what circumstance was it accredited? It was um, not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign and a seal of the righteousness that he already had by faith whilst he was still uncircumcised. Abraham acts as God without a work, without circumcision. That's what this is saying. The forefather, our father of faith, he accessed without any work. So then, he is the father of all who believe. Abraham is your father. But have not been circumcised in order that the righteousness might be credited to them. So Abraham is the father of the Gentiles who access by faith. And he is also the father of the circumcised, the Jews, the people who have the covenant and the seal of that covenant which is circumcision. He's also the father of the circumcised who are not only circumcised. Notice this. It's not circumcision that gives you access. Who are not only circumcised, but who follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham bef had before he was circumcised. Next slide. Next verse. Therefore, the promise comes by Faith, so that it may, may be by grace and may be guaranteed. That guarantee is because it's based on what God did whilst Abraham was asleep, not on what Abraham did. That it may be by grace and guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. Guaranteed, guaranteed. How will I know that my, my descendants will take possession? Covenant. 
When you see guarantee, you read the word cov- I've covenanted, I've oathed, I've promised, I swore by myself, Hebrews 6. Not only those who are of the law, which we'll preach about next week, but those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. And as it, as it is written, I've made you a father of many nations. Can you see the Abrahamic blessing? It's our foundation. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, not worked, in whom he believed. And the God who gives life to the dead and call things into being. This is calling Abraham's body old and dead, but he produced. But it's also calling the Gentiles, those who had no relationship with God, who had no access by prophets and law and priesthoods and covenants. We, had, we were dead. That's very good. Yeah. But he... Whilst he was uncircumcised, accessed. And you and I as Gentiles, accessed by that very same faith. That's why Abraham cannot be our father. The Jews were precious about Abraham being their father. Well, Abraham's our father too. We were adopted in to the family of God. Dead things uh, and cause things alive as though they were not. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it has been said, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old. And that Sarah's room was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief. He did not waver through unbelief. Regarding the promise of God. How will I know that my descendants will take possession? Because God cut covenant, he didn't have to waver unbelief because it wasn't based. See, this is the thing. Some people turn faith into a work. I have to believe in order for it to happen. Belief is not a work. Belief is knowing that God has already done the work on your behalf, that you are now at rest. Regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power, that God had the power, that God had the power. He was dead, but God has the power to do what God promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were not written for him alone, but also for us. So he's the father in that he access first. But we access by that same faith that Abraham had. It was not written for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For, for us who believe in him, he is the sacrificial lamb. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, because we rest whilst God cuts the covenant, whilst we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Bring up Isaiah 53 again. Surely the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. Go back to Romans 5. So, Romans 5. Okay, yeah, 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 it's good. Uh, Justified through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Bless you, Abraham. Bless you, Abraham. You, because through his lineage, we have become blessed. I want to read Galatians 3 for you. Just a few verses. I think it's 8 verses or 10 verses. So Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then, then that those who have faith are the children of Abraham. Watch this. This is powerful. That's why you've got to read the covenants. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. What's the gospel? Rest. I will cut the covenant. Between the Father and the Son and the Spirit, we will cut the covenant. It's called the covenant of redemption. Before the foundation of the earth. And when Abraham sees the covenant, he's seeing a dimension of something that already exists eternally. 
And so Abraham enters into an everlasting covenant, a covenant that has a beginning but will keep on lasting. But he's referencing a covenant that has no beginning and no end. The first covenant is not the Adamic or the Edenic covenant. The first covenant is the covenant of redemption that the Spirit and the Father and the Son cut before time began. It undergirds all of the other covenants. And so when you look at Redemption Symphony, you're looking at a covenant bring out a little picture, a little flavor, a little dimension of what God has provided before time began. Some people look at an old covenant God and a new covenant God and say, I like this God, but I don't like that God. He was grumpy before. No, God was redemptive before time began. God created man knowing what man would do. That's why the lamb was slain before the foundation of the earth. Before you made a mistake, he already paid for it. Because the lamb was slain before the foundation of the earth. How can the gospel announce it beforehand to Abraham that he would justify the Gentiles by faith? Because Abraham was looking at something eternal. Where is Moses and Elijah? When the three disciples come up to see Jesus, there is Moses and Elijah. And I believe that was all the same mountain, all three of them, communing outside of the boundaries of time. And they had a little glimpse into the eternal realm when Moses and Elijah saw the glory of God. Because there's an eternal covenant. And they were longing to look into. And because they were such great men of faith, they had a little glimpse of Jesus. It says that Moses forgo the riches of Pharaoh for the sake of Christ. He saw Christ. Even from a distance. Do you know that Moses didn't enter into the promised land? Because only together with us, the Gentiles, would he be made complete in the great cloud of witnesses. A heavenly country. Do you know that in the old days, the Jews were meant to be so endowed with blessing and favor and wealth that the Gentile nations were meant to look at them and go, surely God is on their side. Surely God has a covenant with them. Wow, we should revere them. Great fear came on the nations when they were marching into the promised land because they thought God has a covenant. This is the God of Israel. Oh, be careful. Do you know that that's exactly what the heavenly man is covenant he's supposed to be in now today so that the Jews the one who had the law and the prophets and the promises they are supposed to be so jealous because they should be taken from the dust and placed into the heaven and that's what you and I walk in but we're still having little petty arguments are we under the law or are we not under the law do I get saved by what I do you're losing out on your inheritance as a heavenly man and God has made us heavenly men and women because of covenant with a greater sacrifice than of Abel, than of Adam's sacrifice, than of Noah, than of even Abraham. It's the sacrifice of the son himself. So Abraham believed God, it was credited to him as, as righteous. And understand then that those who have faith are the children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you, so that those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. A few more verses. Oh, covenant, a uh, redemption symphony. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Hallelujah. Through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Those promises, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. So in Christ Jesus, all are children of God through faith. All are children of God through faith. You're not children of God through circumcision. Not because of what you do, but because of what you believe. For all of you were baptized into Christ and have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, nor slave nor free, nor male nor female. See, God is trying to uh, That's a joke. That's a joke. There's no male or female. For all are one. 
How do you get unity? Rob has preached this many times. You don't get all the, the pianos tuned to each other. It's just a concophony of noise and distraction and chaos. You get them all tuned to the same tuning fork. And when they all tune to the fork, they're all in tune with each other. How do you get unity? Faith. The unity of the faith. And when you have unity with God, you may just have unity with your brothers if they're also in unity. For all are one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Remember, there are three dimensions. Is that, is that all we've got there? Thank you, Lord. <laughs> three dimensions of the covenant. Land, seed, and blessing. The greatest blessing that we have is to know God. That's why in the new covenant it's announced that I will be their God and they will, my pe- they will be my people. And I will not, be like the, I will not re- rewrite a covenant like I did when I took them by the hand out of Egypt. But I will teach them myself. You won't need your neighbor to teach you. For I will be their God and they will be my people. The blessing is to know God. The seed is not Isaac. Although it is figuratively fulfilled in Isaac. The real seed of blessing is the seed, meaning Jesus. And if you're in Jesus, if you're in Christ, then you are the seed of Abraham. And the promises given to you are are accessed the same way that Abraham accessed. By faith. Land, seed, blessing. Thank you, Father, that we have access into your blessing. That we have access to Christ by faith. Thank you, Jesus, that you volunteered as a suffering servant to be ripped in half like those animals were ripped in half before Abraham. That you paid the price. The punishment that brought us peace was upon you. Thank you that you were crushed for our... Thank you that you were crushed for us. Thank you that you were punished for us. Thank you that you justified us. We honor you, Jesus. For all eternity, we have the privilege of honoring you. And Lord, just like Abraham had the choice to be honored by what man could do with the king of Sodom. Or reject that and rely on the picture of Christ, Melchizedek, alone. We also, we do not rely on the law. We do not rely on our works. We do not rely on our ability to bring peace. That we receive the peace that you brought us. Thank you that we have access by faith into grace. By believing that you paid the price. That not only were you punished by your death to justify us, but you were raised to life for our justification. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the one man on the throne making intercession for us before the Father. Thank you that you are the man, Jesus Christ. And then when Abraham saw that man, he became the man of faith. Thank you. We just honor you, Jesus. We just honor you. We thank you for Abraham. We thank you for Adam. We thank you for Noah. (laughs) We thank you for David, for Moses. But Father, most of all, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, thank you for making the picture so clear. Thank you for Redemption Symphony, that all of these notes come together to make a beautiful harmony, to show us the love that you had for us, that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever shall believe shall not perish, but have eternal life. Thank you that we are clothed in Jesus. And we can know That we have possession of the promises because we did not fulfill the promises ourselves, that you fulfill the promises. Thank you, Lord, that we can know, that we know, that we know. Thank you. Just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Isn't he good? Isn't he good? Can I encourage you this week? You know, there's one thing listening to a preach about the covenants. It's beautiful and God willing, inshallah, we listen to more of those. But there's another thing when you read it yourself and you 
you go, God, boy, what does this mean? What is that detail? Why is that in there? And walk the journey like the man of faith had to walk in the promised land. Walk the dimensions of the promise that God has given you. It's wonderful when someone preaches to you. And I've benefited from so much of that. But it's better when the Lord himself teaches you. So go, and go to the scriptures. Go to the spirit and say, teach me. Read Genesis 15. Read Genesis 15. Uh, did I say 15 twice? Read it twice. Uh, <laughs> read Genesis 12. Read Genesis 15, 17. And 22 will knock your socks off. 22 is the most unbelievable picture of what God did for us. It's beautiful. Bless you, City Church. We love you. Make sure you get home safe. <laughs>